My beloved brethren and sisters all over the world, this morning I expressed our greetings to Brother Cook in the hospital, and we wish for Brother Bushy the same great blessings as he carries forward his program. I greet you this morning with deepest feelings of love and gratitude at this, the opening session of the quarterly conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Many things have happened personally and in the church in the interval since our April conference six months ago. I have twice been hospitalized and am most thankful that I am alive and well and able to meet with you today. I thank you for the many prayers offered in my behalf and am grateful that our Heavenly Father answered those prayers with blessings upon me in such rich abundance. Brethren and sisters, once again, I call to our attention the fourth commandment given by the Lord to Moses on Mount Sinai. I remember the Sabbath, to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. In our homes and in our families. Let us refrain from all unnecessary labors. Sunday is not a day for hunting or fishing for swimming, for picnics, for boxing, or for engaging in any other sports. The stores would be glad to close if it were, if they were encouraged by the failure of our people to go to the stores for their shopping. The Lord said, and that thou mayest more fully keep thyself unspotted from the world, thou shalt go to the house of prayer and offer up thy sacraments upon my holy day. For verily, this is a day appointed unto you to rest from your labors and to pay thy devotions unto the Most High. And then comes the glorious promise, and inasmuch as you do these things with thanksgiving, with a cheerful heart and countenance, not with much laughter, for this is sin, but with a glad heart and a cheerful countenance, verily I say that inasmuch as you do this, the fullness of the earth is yours. Once again, I express pleasure with the response that has come to the people to our urging the planting of fruit trees and gardens. Surely as the harvest season comes to a close, there is satisfaction as we garner our products and preserve them and store them. And with all this bounty the Lord has blessed us with, we are grateful. In this same vein, we appreciate the labors of those who have cleaned up, have fixed up, and who have painted up their homes and their fences and their barns and their places as we suggested some time ago. Please keep up with this good work, our brothers and sisters. I, I love you very, 
I love the hymn, brothers and sisters, which, among other things, reminds us prayer is the soul's sincere desire. This is a great. It is a great privilege for us to be able to approach our Father in heaven in this manner, a great personal prayer and a great family prayer, which we remember the Lord opened this dispensation with a personal prayer, his first, and that is an example to us. I hope that not too much of our prayers are silent, even though when we cannot pray vocally, it is good to make a silent prayer in our hearts and in our minds. Never hesitate to gather your family around you for your prayers, especially in those times when more than a morning and an evening family prayer is needed. Extra needs reduce, require extra prayers, our, our good folks. Your little ones will remember how to talk to you, to their Father in heaven, as they learn to talk to you, their parents, and hear your calls and your prayers. They, they will soon see how heartfelt and honest your prayers are. If your prayers are a hurried and thoughtless ritual, they will see this too. Difficult as it seems, I have found when prayers other than family, those in the private and secret, that is, it is better to be concerned with the communicating tenderly and honestly with God rather than hurrying over what listeners may be thinking. The echoing of their amen by the listeners is uh, evidence of their very faithful and uh, great, great approval. Of course, the setting of prayers needs to be taken into account. This is one reason why public prayers cannot be Oh, the whole of our praying because even the family prayers, some, some things are best prayed over only in private where there, there is time and confidentiality are not considered if in these special moments of prayer we hold back from the Lord, it may mean some blessings may be withheld from us. After all, we pray as petitioners before our Lord who is our master. So why should we ever think to hold back feelings we have which are for our Heavenly Father? And we hope that our people will have very bounteous prayers. It would not hurt us either if we paused at the end of our prayers to do some intense listening for a moment or two, always praying as the Savior did, not my will, but thine be done. 
I love the wisdom of Benjamin Franklin when he said, work as if, as if you were to live a hundred years and pray as if you were to die tomorrow. And when the day is done, as well as when it begins, let us not forget to pray. For as George Herbert observed, he who goes to bed and does not pray makes two nights to every day. I always have very tender feelings about prayers and the power to of blessings of prayer. In my lifetime, I have reflected, I have received more blessings than I can ever adequately give thanks for. The Lord has been so good to me. I have had so many experiences in sickness and in health that leave me no shadow of doubt in my heart and mind that there is a God in heaven, <clears throat> that he is our Father, and that he hears and answers our prayers. Again, let me express to all of you publicly my deep and heartfelt sense of gratitude for the many prayers that have been offered in my behalf. During my recent illness, they have been a wonderful source of peace and comfort and healing of body and spirit to me and my beloved Camilla. The Lord has heard your petitions and as, I, as a result, I am privileged to be here today with you in this great tabernacle conference. On this occasion, I have encouraged the saints to keep personal journals and family records. I re renew that admonition. We may think there is little interest in what we say or do, but it is remarkable how many of our families as we pass on down the line are interested in all that we do and all that we say. It is very important that all who can write can write a history that the Lord has left upon the earth. When he placed Adam on the earth, he gave to him the history of the world, the history of the country, and asked his people to write that down from immemorial, from their earliest days. He has been after us to write our journals that were our own, our very own. In Exodus, we read this, and Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. And Father, and it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, I reveal unto you concerning this heaven and this earth, while write the words which I have spoken to you. He spoke again to the Nephite brothers when they went into Jerusalem. And uh, 
when they went to get the plates of brass, and he told them also, Behold, it is wisdom in God that we should obtain these records. These records are that they may be preserved for our children and the language of our fathers. When the Savior visited this continent following his resurrection, he commanded the Nephites to bring their records up to date, saying, Therefore, give heed to my words. Write the things which I have told you. And Jesus said unto them, How be it that ye have not written these things? And it came to pass that Jesus commanded that it should be written. Therefore, it was written according as he commanded. And in our day, the Lord said to the prophet Joseph Smith, and again, let all the records be had in order that they may be put in a, the archives of my holy temple. Let us then continue on in this important work of uh, recording the things we do, the things we say, the things we think, uh, to be in accordance with the instructions of the Lord. For those who may not already have started their book of remembrance and their records, we would suggest that this very day you begin to write your records quite full and complete. We hope that you will do this, our brothers and sisters, for this is what the Lord has commanded. As we look about us, we see many forces at work bent on the destruction of the family, both in America and abroad. Family ties are being destroyed by an ever-increasing divorce rate, by increased infidelity of spouses, by the abominable sin of abortion, which bids well to become a national scandal and is very grave sin. <coughs> Another erosion of the family is the unwarranted and selfish birth control, the strengthening of family ties should become a rallying cry for Latter-day Saint families everywhere. So also could a return to chastity, our most valuable possession, chastity and virtue, our most dear and precious to us, above all things more valuable than rubies or diamonds than herds and flocks, than gold and silver, or than automobiles and land. But sadly, in many cases, they're on sale at the cheapest shops and uh, at the cheapest prices. These virtues cannot be purchased with money but may be enjoyed by all people, even those of humble birth and humble circumstances, as well as the rich, as much as the high school student, as by those who are the professors of the university. Everyone may enjoy these great blessings by living for them. 
the lack of chastity and fidelity and virtue are great wonders and fears for us. We, they are fast becoming worldwide sins which need to be repented of. They cause rivers of tears and uh, the tears flow and the homes are broken. They deprive the, the families, they deprive the children, they deprive all who are entitled to these blessings. The loss of virtue, as you know, has toppled many nations and civilizations. More decadence is a, a villain and his and his forehead is branded with the words dishonesty, bribery, irreverence, selfishness, immorality, and debauchery, and all forms of sexual deviations. Each of us is a son of God or a daughter of God and has a responsibility to measure up to a perfect Christ-like life of uh, self-mastery. <clears throat> Finally returning to God with our virtue. Tonight I plan to speak to the priesthood. The priesthood brethren assembled in the priesthood meeting. There will be hundreds and thousands of them around the world. And to remind them that to have all been blessed with the special women in our lives who have had a deep and lasting influence upon our lives, their contribution has been and is important to us, brethren, and is something which will be of everlasting value to us. I wish to emphasize that that thought this morning, I cannot impress upon all of us too strongly the high place of honor and respect our wives and mothers and sisters and daughters hold in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman nor the woman without the man in the Lord. Brethren, we cannot be exalted without our wives. There can be no heaven without righteous women. Our generation as well as past ones have become drinking people. The drinking craze is destructive of morals. It causes poverty and distress and is responsible for much of the death and carnage on our highways. How can this carnage be stopped? The gospel will do it. The message is from on high. It is the will of God and carries a promise. The Lord has said, all saints who, to, who remember to keep and do these sayings shall walk in obedience to the commandments and shall receive health in their navel and marrow in their bones, and shall find wisdom and great treasures of knowledge, even hidden treasures. The re revelation also says, I have warned you 
and forewarn you by giving unto you this word of wisdom by revelation. The tobacco habit can be cured also by merely living the word of wisdom and the commandments of the Lord. Living the completely chaste life, committing no adultery or fornication, being completely true to one's spouse, and honoring the marriage covenant would rid the world of this terrible thing, of the ravages of the ugly and painful and costly venereal diseases. It would uh, strengthen the home and abolish the evils of divorce and eliminate the necessity for the calamity of unwarranted abortions. One of the major evils of our day while addressing the saints from this pulpit in this in 1948, the late President J. Reuben Clark Jr. spoke concerning having prophets and listening ear. He had, he had read a pamphlet stating, we need prophets. In answer, he said, no, we do not need prophets. We've had plenty of them in many, many years, and they have given us the word of the Lord. The trouble with the world today is they do not want a prophet teaching them righteousness. They want a prophet that will teach them that what they are doing is right, no matter how wrong it may be. A prophet has spoken the prophet is speaking, and do, we do not need another prophet. What we need is listening ear. I pray that we may not only heed the words of, the, of President Clark, but he may, we may listen to all the teachings given by the brethren who will have that, that responsibility. Now I wish to close this message and I bear my testimony to you, my brothers and sisters, who have come far from far and near and who love the Lord and love his program and are so anxious to carry it forward. And I bear this witness to you in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.